What's up guys? For those of you that don't know me, I'm a professional dog trainer, I instruct other dog trainers, and I'm the host of the Dog Talk with Nick Benger podcast, which has allowed me to interview the best dog trainers in the world. And today, I'm gonna to share with you the seven things that I've learned which will make you a better, more successful pet dog trainer. The first tip is a little bit of a cliche, but that's find a mentor. It's obvious through all of the people that I talk to and through my own experience, but having a mentor is a complete game changer. And not only do is that my experience and the people who I interview's experience, but one of my favorite books is Mastery by Robert Greene. And in this book, he details tons of people that have mentors that you know are famous in the fields, are, are the best in their expertise, and what a difference having a mentor had on their progression. For me personally, I've had several mentors, uh, not one in particular, but there's people that I've shadowed and worked with. And then there's also people that I just talk to online all of the time, like my friend Eric Brad from K9 Nation. We would just get on Facebook Messenger and just argue about theory for hours, <laughs> you know? And that's actually made a massive difference to my progression because having to defend my views and, and talk to Eric about stuff, has made me have to have a deeper understanding of all of the theory and, and my philosophy to dog training. One of the best stories for mentorship that I've had on the podcast was when I was talking to Shirag Patel, who's obviously a massive industry expert, and he was talking about how he managed to get Ian Dunbar and Gene Donaldson to mentor him, which is crazy, you know, just as a teenager. And the way that he said he did that was just by asking. There's no magic to it. You just have to have the balls to walk up to them, to send an email, to find their phone number or something and say, hey, can you mentor me? Can I come and shadow you? Blah, blah, blah. And the problem is so many people don't do that. So many people are too nervous and they kind of stay in their own little shell and they don't have the confidence to go out there and find a mentor that they respect and can learn from. Which brings us on to our next step. Don't be a fanatic. Okay, so one problem that people have is they find one school of thought, one um, affiliation, group, whatever you want to call it, and then they just become extremely fanatical about that way of viewing behavior in dogs. They go and find one organization or another and then they become completely tunnel visioned and they don't see these other ways of viewing things. What you need to do is learn as much as you can from one person or one group, but then have the confidence to go out there and seek views that may disagree with your original view. And eventually you will come to your own belief and methodology based on your experiences and your communications with all of these different groups. So rule number three is you have to be a student, which, you know, again, related to the previous rule. You have to be reading all of the books. You have to be watching YouTube videos. You have to be listening to the podcasts. You have to be really taking in the information, you know, do courses and all of that kind of stuff and, and get to a point where you're really competent. And a lot of it does come from doing one-to-one -one sessions or doing classes and just constantly reviewing how you feel it went. You know, I've made massive progression from taking on clients that pushed me out of my comfort zone. But at the same time, you have to be respect the fact that you're there to help that person. If you can't do that, you might need to bring someone else in. But if, if you bring someone else in, then at least ask to be able to shadow that one-to-one uh, -one, or try to find out what was the solution. How did we resolve that situation so that you can better yourself? When I was starting out, I read every book I could get my hands on. You know, I started off with books that were dominance-based dog training because that was what I was first exposed to. But then I heard an alternate view. You know, I kept getting people saying, read Don't Shoot the Dog, read The Culture Clash. And for me, what I did was, okay, you know, I, I um, my current belief was dominance, but at the same time, I want to know the argument for all of these different viewpoints. So I bought Don't Shoot the Dog and I read it. And then within a few chapters, I was like, okay, there is obviously a lot more to this than I realized. So you need to have the same viewpoint no matter what 
it is that you your original standpoint is you know whether you started off with don't shoot the dog you need to read all of these different alternate schools of thought number four is get practical experience i can't tell you how many people i talk to that have read every single book but they don't have the practical experience and a lot of the times they know they don't have the practical experience and they're desperately trying to seek that out and i will admit i think that it's really hard in our industry because Lots of the courses are theory based and you don't actually get to be hands on with dogs. But that's no excuse. What you need to do is get out there, you know, the, find the mentor, find the class that you can shadow or, you know, just slowly build up your experience from very easy cases to um, more difficult cases. You need to get yourself out there in the same way that Shirag did when he approached Ian and Jean. Um, you need to get out there and find people that you can watch, find people that you can help with their dogs. Which brings us to number five, which is you need to learn how to coach. Okay, you can be the f best dog trainer in the world, but if you're rubbish at communicating with people, it's all for nothing. I would much rather be an amazing coach and a mediocre dog trainer than the other way around. Because as a mediocre dog trainer, you can help people because you're going to have more knowledge than them and you're going to be able to help them with their dogs. But as someone that can't communicate at all, you are screwed. You know, this job as a pet dog trainer is all about teaching and helping people with their dogs. And if you can't communicate and help them uh, make progress with their dogs, it doesn't matter how good of a dog trainer you are. You need to learn how to coach. For me, a massive turning point in that was learning sales because sales I know a lot of people are averse to it a lot of people think sales is gonna be used car salesman uh, sleazy etc but it doesn't have to be that way sales is essentially about persuading people and if you've got a say you've got a client with an aggressive dog and they don't want to put a muzzle on their dog but you know if they aren't using a muzzle then they're putting the public at huge risk you need to be able to sell them on the idea that the muzzle is going to help their situation. Otherwise, you could end up with a phone call in a month that that client's dog has bitten someone and is going to have to be put down. Another field that I like for coaching as well is magic stuff. Because when people teach magic or when people uh, give a magic demonstration, they have what they call a patter, which is basically a way of explaining the trick, a way of leading you down a certain narrative and that's the sort of thing that you're doing when you do a one-to-one -one. you need to lead people in certain directions you know we talk about this idea of make it the client's idea because if the client thinks that it's their idea then they're going to have more emotional investment in that going right and if you have that kind of mindset of the way that you say something is going to have an impact on that person's response to it essentially then that is really really valuable sometimes i will know the answer to my client's problem but i will ask questions that lead them to it as opposed to just blurting it out you know i might say where can we put your dog that they wouldn't encounter this problem right now i know they're going to come to the conclusion that they should put their dog in the kitchen and start the training there or whatever the situation is but i will lead them down that path instead of just giving the answer, them the answer straight away, because I know that it's gonna give them a better reaction and a better commitment to the solution. On the subject of sales, point six is learn business. The problem that almost every dog trainer has is we love dogs, we love dog training, but we have no idea how to run a business and we're self-employed, we're forced to run a business. And if you know how to run a business, you can provide your client with a better service. So you need to know how to run a business, not just so that you can make more money, although that is great because you're gonna have more satisfaction with your job, so that you can provide that better service for your client so that they can get better results with their dogs. When I was starting out, I spent years just spending money on courses and learning as much as I possibly could about dog training, but I was broke. I had no money, I couldn't afford petrol. I would. I remember getting stranded at a service station and not being able to afford the petrol that I just put in my car. 
it was extremely embarrassing, but it was a turning point. You know, it made me go home and realize I need to get my shit together. I need to start reading about business. I need to start learning this stuff. And now I've spent years reading as many business books as I can, listening to business podcasts, watching business content on YouTube. And I needed to put that time in, in order to get to the point where I am now, in order to have a successful business that my clients can in, enjoy the training that they're doing with me. And finally, point seven is find your niche. Now I know you're not gonna be able to do this when you're just starting out and you haven't tried anything. You know, you haven't worked with aggressive dogs, you haven't worked with doing puppy classes, you haven't done lead walking or recall or whatever it is. When you're starting out, you kind of have to try stuff and see what really clicks with you, but eventually you have to find your niche. If you scroll through my podcast list, almost everyone in there has a niche. Michael Shikashio, dog aggression. Milena Martini, separation anxiety. Craig Ogilvie, play skills, right? These people have found their niche, and what that allows them to do is become a complete specialist. Michael Shikashio, doesn't need to be able to train obedience heel work to a high standard. And any time he spends training or learning that is time that he isn't spending becoming the world's best expert on dog aggression. He has narrowed his field even more, which has enabled him to become extremely efficient and successful with dog aggression cases. And what's fantastic about that is if you're someone with an aggressive dog, who are you going to go and see? Are you going to go and see the generalist that just takes on every case? Or are you going to go and see Michael who specializes in solving your problem and does it every single day? I hope you enjoyed the seven ways to become a better dog trainer. That's my experience working with the best dog trainers in the world. And what I would suggest you do now on the subject of trying things is watch my other video on scent detection. How to train scent detection. Your dog will absolutely love it. You will love it. And who knows, maybe scent work will become your niche. See ya.